Okay, I think we can we can begin. Um, welcome. I'm Richard Black. I'm the head of policy and strategy at the global clean energy think tank Ember, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar where we're launching the report Beyond Tripling: Keeping ASEAN Solar and Wind Momentum. So this is our second report on the development of electricity generation in the ASEAN region. Um, and it comes at a very exciting time for us, Ember, where we're increasing the analysis of the energy transition right across Asia, in addition to our global and European analyses and the open data products, which you can find uh, on our website. So the report's been written by Ember's senior Southeast Asia electricity policy analyst, Dr. Dinita Setiawati, and she'll be presenting the analysis in a moment. And we're also delighted to have with us Mr. Benny Suriadi, who's the Manager of Sustainable and Renewable Energy at the ASEAN Centre for Energy. So the report, I think, um, comes at a very interesting time in the world as well. We're seeing record additions of wind and solar power this year across the world with, with China, India, the United States and the European Union among those countries and blocks that are making big additions. And despite issues with supply chains and high inflation in many parts of the world, the cost of wind and solar power globally has continued to fall. And um, also in the economic context, um, we're also seeing continued high oil and gas prices due to supply restrictions imposed by OPEC countries. So, you know, this comes at a very interesting time when uh, the cost of energy and the cost of living is on people's minds across the world. And the title of the report, Beyond Tripling, it's also, of course, a reference to the forthcoming United Nations Climate Summit in the United Arab Emirates, which uh, gets underway just in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and there's been a call throughout the year that many of you will be aware of, that's supported by the United Nations itself, by G20 governments, and many other bodies of tripling global renewable power by 2030. So potentially a big moment coming in just a few weeks that could accelerate the growth of renewables across the world. So are ASEAN countries as far down the road as they could be? Um, are they missing out on some of the benefits that um, others will be gaining from their swifter transition to, uh, to renewables? So looking forward to hearing from Dr. Setiawati and also looking forward to taking your questions and comments. You can put them in the Q&A box at any time and uh, we will deal with them at the end. And uh, if you any point, if you want to come up when we get to that section of the webinar, if you want to come up and ask your questions personally, you'd be more than welcome to do that. Otherwise, we can just take the text straight from the, the Q&A box. But uh, now for some thoughts on the overall situation on the ASEAN region, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Benny Suriadi. Over to you. Thank you, Richard Scarabea. Can you hear me? Great day. Right, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Amber, for having me um, in this um, launching of the report. It's going to be a report from the Amber, it's always a mass reading report. Uh, so I'm really excited to be part of the uh, discussion of the launching of the report um, uh, today. And um, this, um, yeah, I know the main stage will be a report from Amber, just be, but before that, just give a to share a brief on the situation uh, that we have in the ASEAN region on the development of the energy landscape, uh, particularly on the issue of the solar and wind in the ASEAN region. So uh, I, I start by um, highlighting the information that ASEAN, uh, the 10 country in the Southeast Asia region, cumulatively set a target to have 23% uh, of renewable energy in its energy mix. So the whole um, uh, portion of the energy mix uh, beyond the power uh, by 23% by 2025. But focusing on the renewable energy power on that the region sets a specific target to have the renewable energy store power capacity to 35% by 2025. Um, the that's the way, but uh, we have seen the progress of renewable energy share in the installed capacity from the year 2005 and the last year, 2020-2022, where it reached around the 3.29% of the total share of renewable of the installed capacity. 
Um, if you see this uh, from the charts as well, the sale uh, stop is a typo that's supposed to be 2022. But um, we also uh, connected and learned the commitment that being made by the countries. Uh, that it will be uh, able to achieve 38.5% of the renewable energy installed capacity by uh, 2025. But then when it goes with the, uh, specifically on the percent of renewable energy, so more will be, I mean, we'll be listening more from Dr. Nidita uh, later, but the fact, I mean, the situation that we have in 2020, about 22 gigawatt of capacity was added, uh, from the collective in ASEAN region, 82% uh, was renewed. And all of this, um, I mean, it singly handed by Vietnam because it uh, significantly increased in the solar capacity. So from the figure, you can see that um, from the total 22 of gigawatt capacity that was added in 2020, uh, solar is around 11, uh, almost 12 gigawatt and is in mostly by the Vietnam. Um, so there are a number of other countries uh, is also follow uh, uh, the path of the Vietnam. Wind, where it's going to be, we've seen it's not, uh, I mean, the very little progress on the wind uh, uh, power in 2020. Uh, uh, some part of the uh, hydro is also a major uh, to contribute to renewable energy development in the ASEAN. That's the story that happened in 2020. Uh, but how about today or the story uh, uh, for the last two years? So um, 2021, 52.1% uh, of the new capacity in ASEAN was from uh, renewable energy. So uh, if you remember the previous figure in 2020 is 82% uh, from renewable energy. In 2021, unfortunately, uh, uh, the direction not in the uh, way that we want it is down to the 52% of the new capacity in ASEAN was uh, from renewable energy. And again, in the 2020, the sale was only 19.5. Um, and uh, major part is coming from the hydro, but it's also significantly contributed by the growth of the Vietnam wind power uh, generation. Of course, as uh, you see in the screen, that coal is a major winner and not happened in the region uh, for the last uh, two years. Um, in the letter report from the Ember, they will highlight how much the uh, uh, in the ASEAN region, particularly the solar and wind, uh, since uh, for the last uh, two decades. Uh, but uh, this is um, the stuff or that we have in the ASEAN region in the upscaling or uh, in advancing our effort in pushing more on the renewable energy, particularly in the solar and wind, where actually that uh, very abundant uh, uh, for us in the ASEAN. Uh, there will be a slide that uh, we have uh, from our um, internal assessment uh, where uh, to utilize solar and wind, not only to fulfilling the domestic needs, uh, but it's also become a backbone to advance the ASEAN power grid. Uh, as many of you that are familiar with the ASEAN power grid, this is a regional aspiration to have integrated um, uh, electricity system, electricity infrastructure, that allowing to optimize the uh, resource indigenous resource um, in the region to fulfill the electricity need uh, in the 10 countries. Um, so from this, that we also recognize the very significant potential, the technical potential uh, of the solar and wind that can be harnessed uh, to uh, support uh, the development of the ASEAN power grid so that can be um, uh, generated uh, to fulfill the electricity and the, uh, at the national level for domestic, but it also can be important to the neighboring country who are lacking the resource on uh, renewable energy. So um, theoretically, that we're expecting a potentially 
computing to the total of the 60, uh, 60 to 100 gigawatt of interconnected uh, capacity. And um, in uh, our own database itself, we identified 42 solar sites and 20 wind sites um, that um, uh, potentially can be uh, optimized or can be further developed uh, to support the ASEAN program. Uh, the key question right now is how uh, to set the policy framework um, to support this duality, how to bring the significant investment um, to the region as well, uh, because this is a, a major challenge that's being experienced by, by the region to uh, from the around 29 or 30 billion um, uh, required for renewable energy development in the region uh, for the last 10 years on afraid is going to be 8 to 7 uh, 8 to 9 uh, billion or one third on the average is going to be um, so I, I, I hope it will be able to set this on uh, on the further discussion and then what should the ASEAN do uh, to tripping uh, when we have the momentum um, uh, we'll look forward to me for the report from the Dr. Dinita I stop here and back to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's uh, that's wonderful. Um, and if you'd like to stop sharing your screen uh, as well, Pak that would be uh, great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, um, if you're able to stay with us, I'm sure that uh, there'll be some very interesting questions um, potentially for you um, as well. Okay, without many further ado, let me turn now to Dr. Dinita Setiawadi, who's going to take you through uh, the main points of the analysis that Ember is presenting today. Hey, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you very much, Pat Benny. It's a very exciting time for us, then, I think, especially seeing that we have added 23 gigawatts of the renewable in 2020 alone. And um, you're right, like having the right policy and stronger policy is, is the main question, the million dollar question, actually. Let me just share my screen now and um, do. Okay. Okay, so we, I'm going to present today about the report that is being launched beyond tripling, keeping ASEAN solar and wind momentum. And thank you very much for everyone who attend this webinar today. Um, I'm going to talk about the first is about the solars, ASEAN solars and wind progress, and then the ASEAN pathway to net zero emissions. And then the next session would be policy updates from several ASEAN countries and then goes to applications and recommendations. Okay, the first is about our key statistics. In a report, stronger policy measures are needed to accelerate solar and wind growth. First off, there is a need for ASEAN countries to accelerate renewables, particularly solar and wind, to decrease emissions to the power sector. One of the key statistics in the report is that ASEAN has recorded 40% average annual growth in solar and wind generation between 2015 and 2022. And this growth is largely attributed by Vietnam, which we will see in one of the charts. The second statistic is that we see a year-on-year -year increase in wind generation across ASEAN from 2021 to 2022. And then the last key statistic is that 229 gigawatts is an additional solar and wind capacity needed across Southeast Asia by 2030 to align with the IEA's 2015 as zero scenario. Moving on to the key findings of the report, the first, I elaborated it before, that we recorded 43% average annual growth, which also attributed to 14% of total electricity demand growth seen in the same period. And the second key finding is that ASEAN wind and solar power generation slowed down in 2020 compared to 2021. The growth of solar and wind generation was 50% in 2022, but it was 67% in the preceding year. And we will discuss about this in more details in our next session. The third key finding is that aligning with IEA 2015 and zeros demands ASEAN to more than triple renewables. So the IEA estimates that for ASEAN region to be on track for their net zero emission scenario, we need to achieve a 23% share of solar and wind in total electricity generation. This will require additional 
164 gigawatt solar capacity and 65 gigawatt wind capacity by 2030, building on the current capacity of 34 gigawatt. The last key finding is that over 99% of the wind and solar potential in ASEAN remains untapped. However, these potential are mainly found in the mainland countries of ASEAN. Okay, next slide is that ASEAN wind and solar power generation slowed down in 2020 compared to the previous year. So if you look at this chart, Vietnam dropped up ASEAN wind power growth in 2020 while solar progress is slow. And we see in the first illustration for ASEAN, solar growth has slowed down by a uh, slow down since 2022-2022 while wind generation actually increased. And this trend, you can see the similarities between the trend being in Vietnam and ASEAN. Meanwhile, in Indonesia, solar generation has grown to almost double between 2021 and 2022. And you can see also in Malaysia and Philippines, Thailand and Singapore, solar generation grows quite significantly. For wind power, we see a different story here. In Vietnam, the wind generation grew, but it was likely because of the additional wind capacity installations in 2021 that contributes to the growth. While in Indonesia, Malaysia, Malaysia has not has no wind power power capacity, but in Philippines, Thailand, uh, we see that wind generation has also slowed down, namely implicated by the changing climatic condition in that particular year. And then we also just want to reiterate that we don't have the data for Cambodia, Laos, PDR, and Myanmar for the year 2022. Right, the next slide is showing us that Vietnam is leading the way for wind and solar power in the ASEAN regions. So we see here the share of electricity generation in 2022 or the latest year. So we see that Vietnam has 13% solar and wind power in comparison to the total power in, in their own respective countries, while other countries record less than 5% of solar and wind share in the electricity generation. So I've come across this really interesting study by uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on NREL about the potential of solar and wind resources in ASEAN. And we can see that solar PV potential are really abundant in Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, and also wind potential are abundant in uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. However, over 99% of the wind and solar potential in ASEAN remains untapped, which demonstrated significant growth opportunities for this country. So we see that um, the potential is untapped mainly because historically in ASEAN have been relying on traditional fossil fuel plant generation, for example, like in Indonesia or Thailand or Malaysia. Okay, moving on is the next section, which is the ASEAN pathway to net zero emissions. Aligning with the IEA 2060 net zero emission scenario demands ASEAN to more than triple renewables by 2030. So in the, in the IEA report, we see that for Southeast Asia, the share for wind and solar is expected to reach 23% by 2030. And as I mentioned before, this requires a quite significant capacity addition for solar and wind. So here I show you two scenarios. The first is by the IEA, which illustrates how much solar that as Southeast Asia would need to install by 2030, which is about 164 gigawatt and for wind, which is about 65 gigawatt, or total combined capacity target of 263 gigawatt by 2030, building on the current capacity of 34 gigawatt. This means more than triple than current capacity. 
of the animation is 434 gigawatts. Apparently, if you show that the least cost optimization scenario listed in the ASEAN 7 energy outlook in this chart, and um, we uh, consider the technology neutral optimization scenario applied to the power sector, considering the cost effectiveness, the maturity of technology to fulfill the growing energy demand, including the deployment of energy storage and interconnection. So Pak Benny might be able to elaborate more on this LCO scenario later. And I should also add that the ASEAN 7 energy outlook has several scenarios, including the APAIC regional target by 2040 and um, this LCO scenario by 2050. So moving on to policy updates from several ASEAN countries, the region expects to boost the growth of clean power through policy support despite some remaining challenges. And then there's this chart that shows the growth of wind and power generation in the past decade. And we see that after the fit in tariff policy introduction in Vietnam in 2017, the solar and wind generation has up quite significantly, and the trends in ASEAN replicate what happened in Vietnam. And next is this table depicts the solar and wind targets um, for several ASEAN countries by 2030, and for Thailand, I listed the year by 2037. And we can see here that the ASEAN countries are banking on solar projects to accelerate the transition. Only Vietnam has quite significant wind targets, which is 27.9 gigawatts in their recent PDP-8 that was published uh, this year, I think. Okay, let me move on to stories of individual countries from the five ASEAN countries. The first is about Indonesia. Indonesia's solar generation is lowest among all five ASEAN countries. Wind generally has not become a predominant source of energy in Indonesia because of several factors, including a limited wind potential and limited land availability for wind installations. There are also difficulties in logistics, and shipments of large wind turbines that require large cargo ships for them. And however, Indonesia has managed to install the first large-scale wind solar power wind power plant in Sidrap, and it contributed to about 143.5 megawatts in 2018. And the Eru PTL or the Electricity Business Plan emphasized an additional capacity of solar at 4.68 gigawatts and 0.6 gigawatts of wind. However, this numbers might change it because Jet the CLKT has called for a larger renewable energy share of 44% by 2030. And we found there are some changes in the policy regarding to wind and solar in Indonesia. The first is the changes in pricing mechanism for renewable energy projects from fit in tariffs to ceiling sizes. This was enacted in the president's Presidential Regulation 112, number 2022. So previously, FIT was determined based on the cost of electricity in each region versus the national cost of electricity. So it would either be determined at 85% of one or 100%, depending whether the regional cost is higher or lower than the average national cost. The second, and I think it's quite important that rooftop PV regulation will no longer count electricity exports as bill deductions. So this has been also included in the RUPTL that space um, PLN faces several challenges in uh, after the introduction of rooftop PV solar policy in 2018. So there are high operation costs to adjust the grid system flexibility in receiving the intermittency of solar energy. Unfortunately, the 25% surplus from exported electricity do not cover such costs. And the last is that the domestic content for solar model components will be 60% from the 1st January 2025. 
Currently, it stands at 40% for solar module components. The government been trying to change it to 60% since 2019. But because of the limited development of solar module industry in the country, um, it stays at 40%. Also for wind power, the domestic quantum requirements is similarly at 40%. Okay, next we have Malaysia. Malaysia has uh, largely um, dependent on coal, gas, and hydro for its power. And the solar contributed to 1.5% of here. And based on the latest data, no wind power is being developed in Malaysia. The country also banking on large-scale solar building programs and leasing of rooftop space for solar off-takers and net degrees scheme, which allow the household business customers to uh, export electricity generated to the grid on one on one one on one basis. And Malaysia also has green electricity tariff or gas offered by CNB, the Tanaga National Berhad, or the state electricity the company Malaysia for customers which are determined based on quota basis. And GAP has reached its target quota by almost 2,000 users last year from the household industrial and commercial customers. And next we have the Philippines. Philippines is also very interesting because they have a moratorium for coal power plants since 2020. And they saw a good growth of solar as of the data between 2022 and 2023. And in the Philippine power development plant, the target capacity for solar is actually the highest after Vietnam. And solar is also has the highest target between all energy sources in their power development plan. So in the 2040 target, solar will reach about 46 gigawatts and 12 gigawatts for wind. The solar is increased is anticipated will be coming from their off-grid electrification program or rural electrification, which utilizes solar home system units. Okay, let me add about Philippines because it presents interesting case for renewable energy acceleration because they are one of the largest nickel producers in ASEAN. There are opportunities to decarbonize the industry sector using solar and wind and increase Philippines' competitiveness for the carbon border adjustment mechanism or other trade policy measures. Right now, we move on to Thailand. Thailand recorded a 17% growth in solar generation from 2021 to 2022. They have high reliance on fossil fuels where gas has the largest share, followed by coal and bioenergy. Thailand also recently introduced fit in tariffs to further boost their large scale solar projects. And the government has introduced rooftop solar incentives for residential users. And the incentive stands at seven cents US dollar per kilowatt hour. Thailand also has started the commercial operation of 3 megawatt solar power plants and 4 megawatt battery energy storage to be in line with their goals of being carbon neutral by 2050 and net zero by 2065. And the last country that I'm going to discuss is about Vietnam. Vietnam is quite an amazing case and a lot of scholars provide interesting story on Vietnam. Vietnam recorded the largest growth of wind and solar in ASEAN between 2015 and 2022 due to the domestic policy which enables the growth of renewables. Right. The first one is with tariffs served as a effective scheme in 2017 that uh, where the tariffs stands between 6 cents US dollar per kilowatt hour to 10 cents US dollar per kilowatt hours. And they also have land lease exemptions for solar projects, which show good coordination between the national and the local governments. And they also have a lack of local quantum requirements for renewable energy projects, along with tax exemption for uh, goods imported for these renewable energy projects. And, and Vietnam also introduced rooftop TV solar incentive for households at 8.38 cents US dollar per kilowatt hour, slightly higher than Thailand. However, this incentive um, 
below forty four thousand dollar will be exempt from personal income tax. It means additional incentive for solar for rooftop PV users in Vietnam. And then the latest policy development is that auction mechanism will be introduced in replace of bid in tariff for large scale solar projects. Vietnam also have most ambitious solar and wind target in ASEAN in their PDP-8 thus far. I might also need to add that Vietnam faces some curtailment issue, which means wasted resources due to sub technical problems in integrating intermittent solar to the grids and pricing mechanism is not yet determined. So all in all, um, our implication recommendation for policymakers, policymakers need to elevate clean power supply and stimulate demand to comprehensive policies and international support. Replicating the success the region wide means we need to enhance and adopt similar strategy and have a holistic domestic policy supported by the international community to ensure grid stability, energy security, and economic competitiveness. Lastly, these are the key policy recommendations from the report diversifying and renewable energy supply and increasing solar and wind generation means that policymakers need to ensure efficient supply chains, increased flow of capital investments to boost local renewable energy industry to make the market more attractive for project developers, local content requirement relaxation, more fiscal incentives, and more investment to ensure grid flexibility and infrastructure. At the demand side, having renewable portfolio standards would likely to stimulate for the demand for renewable energy and making green electricity tariffs available to attract green companies can make renewable energy cost competitive compared with conventional energy. In the ASEAN countries having a green Special economic zones can ease green industrial development, meaning the zone that is fully powered by green power. So, and all in all, policies that integrate trends, for example, in ESG or scope free emission, could further stimulate demand. So, in summary, changes will incur some cost. Having policies in place to mitigate the risk brought by such changes and support ASEAN in interpreting the global goal of the tripling of renewables. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dita. Wonderful stuff. And um, just to uh, to reiterate that um, we'd love to get your questions um, and your comments. Um, if you'd like to put them into the Q&A box, that would be fantastic. And we can just pick them up from there. But equally, if you'd like us to upgrade you to a panelist so that you can have a conversation uh, with Danita uh, or, or with Pac Benny, please do that as well, because we can absolutely do that. So just type that in the Q&A box along with your question, if you would like to do that. So we've got one point uh, coming in, which I'd like to uh, put to uh, perhaps Danita, first of all. Uh, and, and the question is this, why was the feed-in tariff policy successful in Vietnam? And Basically, could um, other countries in the ASEAN region look at what Vietnam has done, uh, look at why it worked, and then sort of adopt something that's similar to that? What do you think, Danita? Okay, thank you for the question. It's very interesting because I actually collected the feed-in tariff in that particular year in 2017, before 2017 and beyond. And Vietnam actually had the lowest feed-in tariff compared to Indonesia. Malaysia and the Philippines. So it's not because solely of the fit policy itself, but the other supporting policy that you know um that supports the flow of investment to Vietnam in renewables, for example, I mentioned about their land allocations and tax exemptions, and just the ease of doing business in Vietnam in comparison with other asset countries, of course, which lead to the boost of the solar growth. That's very interesting. So it wasn't really just the feed-in tariff, it was a much broader range of policies that 
facilitated the build out of uh, of, of solar. Okay. Um, yes. 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 Okay. Great. Um, I, I want to I want to turn to Pat Benny, if I if if I may, uh, and ask um, about the place of flexibility and international cooperation, because um, the, the, w w one of the things that stood out to me from you, both of your presentations was the the wide variety that there is in the potential for wind and solar between the different ASEAN countries. And also, Pat Benny, you had this map showing sort of potential interconnection routes. So what is the role of, of, of international collaboration to build out the grid and also the, 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 the place of, of the, the need for flexibility mechanisms? I posed that question to Pat Benny, but actually I think he's no longer with us. He did message us earlier saying that his interconnect, internet connection was... Uh, was unstable, so I think we've lost him for the moment. Um, uh, Denita, is that something you'd like to uh, to comment on? Um, I think definitely international collaboration would support, and I think as the region, if we have projects to, for example, international investors on the interconnectedness, as the interconnectedness, mm. it would provide a much more interesting story, and yeah, it would boost the renewables higher. Great, thank you. And as you mentioned, Thailand has started to um to to promote investment in battery storage as well. So maybe that's yeah, one think, of yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very important development in Thailand because you know battery storage is uh is like the most likely solutions for the archipelago of country in ASEAN where mm. you know national grid is not in connected and then there's many rural areas that need electrification uh, from this PV and battery combo. Yeah. Okay. Um let me turn to a question from uh Rodrigo Jimenez who says um will the growth of solar capacity and wind uh in a country such as Vietnam uh will that be really affected by curtailment? So is the demand so is is the grid insufficient? That again, we'll see the need for synthetic demand for things like green hydrogen production and also battery storage. I think you mentioned that that actually had become started to become an issue in Vietnam. Yes. So is um yes, you're totally right. So the growth of solar capacity and wind, especially solar in Vietnam, has been capped by curtailment because there's two reasons. One is the grid is insufficient to absorb the intermittency of solar power. And then the second is that I think the government is still waiting for the new fit in tariff or financing mechanism in place before decided to, you know, to absorb the holes or generations that um yeah that being exported by the generators there. On my mute button. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in many other regions of the world, uh, curtailment is starting to become an issue as well in in wind and solar rollout, and we're seeing the need for um for for regulators and so on to look at the addition of grid capacity and flexibility in line with the uh, rollout of renewables. Um, thanks very much for that question, uh, Rodrigo. And if any if anyone else has a question or a point you'd like to put to Danita. Please, as I said, do type it in the Q&A box uh, or let us know if you want to come up and, uh, and ask it in person. Um, we also have a question from uh, Nitin Koka, who says um, he'd like to ask about the role of Japan, which he says is heavily pushing alternatives to wind and solar, such as CCS, gas, co-firing with ammonia in coal plants, and not just in Japan, but also across Southeast Asia uh, as well. So is this do you think playing a role in the slowdown of renewables in the region or having other adverse impacts? Yeah, first of all, I think CCUS technology is still in its early stages. It's really expensive and it needs time to mature to be a technology that is economically viable, especially for Southeast Asia. So having a laser like focused on such technologies might risk prolonging the life of fossil fuels while diverting investment from clean energy. So instead of you know starting from scratch the feasibility studies in CCUS, we could use the money to 
upon research and development in solar wind or battery technologies. Um, I also think that the immediate term and midterm Southeast Asia decarbonization efforts will benefit more from the quick and cheap solutions like wind and solar, coupled with an increasingly advanced battery stock storage technology. So yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Nathan. It's a very important point, I think. Yes, it's a really excellent question. Um, it was interesting to note in the in the G20 declaration, um, which came out uh, a couple of months ago, there was this commitment from the G20 countries to the to, to pursue the goal of tripling renewables. But it also talked about the same scale of build out in other technologies, including potentially CCS as well. Um, one other thing just to mention is that there was just um, last week, actually, uh, a new report out from the International um, Carbon Capture and Storage Association, which looks at basically what's happened in carbon capture and storage over the last uh, year. So uh, if you're interested, particularly interested in what's happening in that world, um, have a look at the reports. <clears throat> and I think one of the things it speaks to is that we're not actually seeing a massive scaling up and actually virtually all of the new projects that have come in line over the last year are for enhanced oil recovery where the gas is actually used to force more oil out of the ground and of course there are big questions about whether that really is a clean uh, technology uh, as well. Thank you Rodrigo Jimenez for tucking in uh, another couple of questions. Um, so uh, for Danita, so from all of these countries, do we see any strong demand driver are there businesses, for example, data centers or industries that are actually driving this, this demand for renewables? In other parts of the world, we are seeing this, of course, and the demand for power purchase agreements, um, which provide clean electricity at uh, guaranteed prices over strong periods. Um, and also inside of ASEAN, which countries are looking to cross-border mechanisms or, or funding cross-border mechanisms that can speed up uh, the green transition? Right. Thank you very much for your question, Rodrigo. Yes, um, you're right for the industrialization, especially the demand in the mineral and mining sector is the driver for strong, you know, electricity demand in the region. We can expect the electricity demand will increase in Indonesia and in Philippines. But not only that. But it should also have a growing population. And if we see, we can see that the per capita demand is not as high as other countries in the world. However, you know, this large population contributes to the large demand and thus the large emissions because, for, for example, like in Asia, that is pretty much powered by the coal. So emission would look very high. And moving on to your second question, which countries are cost border funding the green transition in the region. Interestingly, I just read the news that Singapore is going to purchase energy generated from solar power in Indonesia from the, I think Quantum Asia is building a solar power plant in the Rio Island in Indonesia. So we can see these trends in the future, like smaller countries from like Singapore that do not have you know, land, um, massive land areas for renewables, will funding the green transition in the region. Talking of funding, one of the issues that uh, Pak Benny alluded to was international finance and international support. Um, and of course, we, we we're seeing you know the discussion of the. the Jet P um, uh, proposal that's been put forward for Indonesia. How important do you think it is that there are mechanisms like that that leverage international funding into ASEAN? Or really, is it more a question of ASEAN governments looking at what is beneficial for their own development and actually starting to stimulate things themselves? I think a little bit of both would be beneficial for ASEAN because, you know, um, as you see in the chart, uh, but as your emissions, I reiterate that international funding is needed. If the world demands ASEAN to be on track to the IEA net zero emission scenario by 20, 2030, you know, a increase to 200 gigawatts of wind and solar power plants are quite huge. And at the same time, I think these funding can also be stimulated 
from inside the country and we harnessing the power of the people, involving the people in the transition, having rooftops of our TV policy that is beneficial for the country, but also beneficial for the people, would also you know, further stimulate the growth of renewables in the region. So yeah. those are the answers, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, now, if anyone's got um, a burning question or comment, please do put it in the Q&A uh, because we're heading towards our closing time. If there aren't any more uh, questions or comments, then we can finish um, a few minutes uh, a few minutes early. Um, but I've, I've just got one more question for you, Danita, if, if that's all right. So you, we saw, obviously, as you mentioned, 45% growth year on year. And then we saw a slowing down last year, marked slowing down due to the policy changes in, in, in Vietnam mainly. Um, to what extent do you think that that is a blip caused by this policy change in Vietnam? Like, you know, if that hadn't happened, is your instinct that we would have seen continued 45% growth and we might actually return to that once uh, the new policy regime in Vietnam kicks in? I think at some point the blip is going to happen, whether it's sooner or later, because Vietnam... Correct me if I'm wrong, um, scholars in Vietnam hadn't really um, really invested into increasing their grid flexibility. Mm -hmm. And we see this problem also not, also, not only in Vietnam, but in other countries like India and in Indonesia. So I think having a holistic policy that stimulate the investment in grid flexibility and modernization of the grid is really important to be able to absorb the renewable energy from yes that is that's generated and i also see several projects in the region that is focusing on grid flexibility and you know this is a really great improvement instead of you know building more renewables more renewables without having an, a, a, an equipped grid to absorb that it will be yes it will be better too improve yeah. the grid yeah wonderful well thank you very much so as there are no more uh questions uh in the box i think we will close just a few minutes um early it only remains for me to thank uh Denita for this wonderful analysis and for coming to present it today and also to thank uh, mr benny suriadi for joining us um i'm sorry that he couldn't stay with us for the whole question and answer section uh session but it was wonderful to hear his insights um as well and you can look up of course more of the center's work um, on their website as you can look up more of ember's uh, analysis both global and regional on our website as well um finally i'd just like to tell you that next tuesday the 21st ember's launching quite an exciting project for us a new global tracker which is looking at the renewable energy targets set by countries uh, across the world and that's accompanied by a report on how those targets are matching up to that goal of tripling the global renewable capacity by 2030. So there's a launch event uh, next Tuesday, the 21st. And if you'd like details, then follow us on social media at Ember Climate on Twitter, uh, or X as we should call it now, is probably the best, or get in touch with our communications team. So um, many thanks indeed for joining us, all of you, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at a future event, a future Ember event uh, at some point.